between uh, the sessions here. And I hear, I hear this. People uh, feel forgotten about. Does anyone really notice me? Does anyone really care about me? Everyone needs love. Everyone needs to be loved. God created us to be loved. God created us to be loved. And we are so bad at it. So here's what we do. People are inherently bad at loving. They don't know how to love. And so what we do in an effort to get this love is we keep going to the wrong place keep going to people. And then what happens is those people who don't really know how to love very well and then it really hurts. Mm -hmm. And it really, really, really hurts. What we do is we were created to be loved but we were also created to love. And there's a scripture that says he loved me, or he loved us, therefore. We love because he first loved us. <clears throat> now, here's the interesting about, thing about that. It's not the way that love works. Is that love isn't, you don't love, and then, and now, and now you start loving back. That's not how it works, okay? True love loves without getting anything back. True love loves without getting anything back. And that's why we're so bad at it. Because we so badly want to be loved. So we give something to somebody else, hoping for something in return. And when that person can't fulfill what we were really looking for, then it really just hurts. Go back, you know? Um, <clears throat> you know, there's, there's this thing, too. The reason why we want to be loved is because we want to be appreciated. We want to be valued. Okay, that's what love does. Love speaks to your value. So if I'm loving somebody, I'm showing them value. Okay, so that's another reason why we go to people. We go to people because we're hoping that they will be able to give us some sort of worth. That makes sense? Right? So we keep on going to our friends or go to maybe a boyfriend or even to our mom and dad. And we're looking for that approval. We're looking for someone to... Say, I approve of you. Uh, you know, you're worth something to me, mm-hmm. right? And it's really the worst place to go to. And there's the reason why. Because people... <laughs> it's really the worst, people to, worst place to go to because people are fickle, all right? So you might have a good day or next day you might have a bad day, right? And so... And then somebody comes to that person to get love from them, and they have a bad day. And they start saying awful things to this person, not even knowing the weight of their words and how much it really hurts that person, right? So there's this balance. There's this balance of caring what people think but not caring what people think. And I find this to be true. A lot of people are like, I just don't care what they think. And those are the people that care the most. Say that again. Some people will say I just don't care. I just don't care what people say. I don't care what people think about me. Those people that say that care the most. It hurts them the most. And that's the reason why they're saying that. It's kind of like that person who says, I'll never be hungry again, right? I'll never be hungry again. And so they stockpile all this food and uh, they work two, three jobs, never see their family and everything else in their life suffers, right? Because of this fear. I'll never be hungry again, right? I haven't actually met, um, for instance, uh, a lesbian, someone who struggles with same-sex attraction for women, uh, that wasn't hurt by a man. The reason why is because they were 
doing it the wrong way over here. They got hurt. And now they just think, well, women understand me better. That's really what women are looking for, is somebody to understand them. <laughs> That's what the Bible says. Husbands, be understanding of your wives. All right? Here's what happens, too. Is we're, the reason why we keep looking for that value is because we feel not valued. Something about us doesn't feel valued. Okay? Maybe we were hurt. Maybe somebody took advantage of us, right? When we were younger or whatever. Or maybe we were picked on as a kid or whatever. You name it. Everybody here struggled with some sort of devaluing. Okay? Mm -hmm. We felt devalued somewhere, whether it be from our friends, from our parents, from somebody who hurt us, from a bully. We feel devalued. And so then, in an effort to not feel that anymore, we do all kinds of stuff, like crack jokes and stuff. And like with boys, it's usually cracking jokes and stuff, you know? The most insecure person is the loudest one in the room. Everybody's getting quiet now, right? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> it's true. Listen, I, I was I was a loud one in, in school. People made fun of me all my life. You know, I had real big insecurities. And so I just wanted to make people laugh. You know, I was horrible at it. I was horrible. I could not make people laugh. <laughs> now I'm making y'all laugh. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, I mean, the worst thing somebody could tell me was I was annoying, you know. And I remember my friends would tell me, you're annoying. You know, you're ugly or, or whatever. And I would just get so beat up. And in my heart, I was—I so badly wanted people to like me. Mm -hmm. And I remember being in high, being in junior high, and I was in the—I was in musicals, and I'd perform, and I'd sing, and I'd do—I um, was the lion in the in the in the in the Wizard of Oz, you know. And I was uh, Evil Life Legal in Will Abner. But anyway, I loved acting, and I loved acting because when I was acting, everybody praised me, you know. Everybody give me a hand or whatever. And something happened. I, I started wanting to people to like me more. And so in my acting, people liked me. And it wasn't until later on that I realized people didn't really like me. They just liked what I was acting. They liked fake Zach. You know? You know what they liked? They liked what Zach could offer them, some entertainment. And I realized that people didn't care about me. People didn't love me just for me. People didn't want, you know, whenever that hit me, I was like, oh, man. And I remember being in my room crying to God and telling God, you're the only one who really knows me. Now that was a low spot, but it was also a high spot. Because when I realized God was the only one who knew me, it made me realize that he was really the only one who knew how to love me. He was the only one who really knew what I needed. And it caused me to really dig deeper into God and seek him and find out what he said about you know, we talk about, you know, we always hear that phrase, it's not about us, you know. And what I mean is, um, we all struggle with pride. And what I found is that pride is really deep-rooted insecurity. When we say, you know, when you look at the word pride in the dictionary, it has to do with um, having some sort of uh, self-accomplishment, right? So you find your value or your worth in your accomplishments. Okay, so if you're an actor or whatever, you do good acting and people praise you, praise you and say, good job. Preachers get up on stage and if they struggle with insecurity and pride, then they're looking for that next person to come up to them and pat them on the back and say, good preaching. You know? If we're, uh, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. If we're, if we're, huh? <laughs> if we're, if we're uh, girls, you know, put on makeup and want to look pretty for the next boy or whatever, and we're looking for somebody to like us, you know, compliment our outfit, make us feel special. And, you know, it can be dangerous. It can really be dangerous because we start finding our worth from other people. And that's really a faulty place to find our worth. <clears throat> My wife, when we were in college, one day I found her on the bedroom, laying down on the bed, crying. And I asked her, what's the matter? Why are you crying? She said, well, I looked in the mirror and I'm just so ugly. I was like, golly. Oh, she put makeup all the time, you know, which I don't have anything against makeup unless if you're using it to hide. <laughs> which I think a lot of people do. Mm -hmm. My wife was like, the, the mirrors, I mean, I looked in the mirror and I just looked so ugly. Do you know what I did? <laughs> Went and got a screwdriver and I took down every mirror in my house. 
went to the bedroom in the bathroom, I took down all the mirrors. I found the little mirrors that were flipping flip mirrors in her in her pocket and in her purse. I took them away. Well, she was still crying on the bed on the bed when I was doing all this. So I got all the mirrors down, went in there and found her. I said, Listen, look, look up. I said, Look at me. You're not allowed to look in the mirror anymore for the next thirty days. You're gonna fast from mirrors. And I told her, Whenever you wanna find out if you, what you look like, you just ask me. And I'll tell you. So every day, my wife didn't even put makeup on for 30 days because she couldn't do her own makeup, right? <laughs> you know, she'd do her hair. The only thing she did was fix her hair. We put some mousse in her hair. It would be all curly. And she said, how do I look? I look, you look beautiful. You know? And every day, I just told her, you need to stop looking at the mirror because the mirror is lying to you and it's telling you falsehoods. Mm-hmm. You're believing a lie about yourself and you're taking it very deep into your core. And I told her, I said, I love you just the way you are beautiful. Now a lot of people are going to misinterpret that and be like, yeah, I need to find a good man and husband will tell me that. No, you don't. <laughs> because see, what we are as husbands is we're a type and shadow of Jesus. Mm-hmm. So the reason why children need a father is because the father is a type and shadow of the heavenly father. The reason why we have husbands is because the husband's a type and shadow of our husband, Jesus. And so if we're good husbands and if we're good fathers, then we'll demonstrate what God does, okay? <clears throat> but there comes a point where where even even if you're not careful, you'll go to your spouse or your boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever to find your value, you know? You know, men men uh, they want to they feel valued and important when they got a girlfriend or whatever, you know? Just wait till she rejects you. Then what happens? <sighs> Everything falls out. That's why, that's why, uh, that's why young young teenage boys kill themselves after their girlfriend breaks up with them because they idolize something they were never supposed to idolize. So here's the thing: we are not to go to people for our definition. We're not to go to people to help define our value. People cannot define you. Okay, only God can do that. <clears throat> On the other hand. You, as being a representative of Jesus, should be loving people and giving them unconditional love and giving them their value. Because you may be the only representat- representation of Jesus they're going to see. And so it, it does matter what people think, but it doesn't matter what people think. You see? It does matter what people think because I need to be able to speak life to you. If I can't speak life into you, and I don't, I'm not worried about what's going on in your mind, you know, and what you're thinking... I won't be able to communicate effectively to you and give you truth that's going to set you free, right? But if I'm worried about what you think about me, well, then we've, I just replaced God with you, you know? <clears throat> there comes this point where we really get locked down into this victim mentality because everybody's been hurt, right? So we get locked down into victimhood. So everybody's been victimized, but then what people do is they become a victim and they stay there, right? So then what happens is when things start going wrong in their life, they start accusing everybody else. They'll say, well, such and such did this to me. Well, you did that to me. That's why I did this to you. So we live in victimhood. Okay? And what a victim is, is a, he's, he's, a, he's a victim. He's never a winner. <laughs> we stay in that mentality of being a victim. We never become winners. We never in our mindset realize what God has created us to be. That's why the scripture teaches us that we're more than conquerors through Christ who gives us strength, right? But what we do is we've been taken advantage of. We've been hurt. People have hurt us. People have done things bad to us, right? And now we're stuck there, and we don't know how to get out of that. So that's why it's important for us to stop going to people for who we are and start going to Christ for who we are. Because yeah. he defines who we are and tells us, hey, this is what I made you to be. You're a life giver. You have much value. Do you know why you have much value? Because you don't understand how much you really have to offer until you start following Jesus. Have you ever heard of that scripture that talks about don't cast your pearl before swine? Don't cast your pearl before swine. There was times in my own life where I was where I'd want to talk with somebody and I I was really hoping at the end like I would be talking and I'd be like, hey, did y'all really like what I had to say? And I realized that it's like so insecure, right? I really wanted people to tell me I did a good job instead of actually caring about what they needed. I was more concerned about if if I said something cool. 
Rather than and, and them telling and affirming me as, oh, you're a good guy, man. You're you're awesome. And, and hearing the compliments, like I would tell people, let's put it this way, I was ministering to them for myself. You see? Because I was telling them things, but I was just telling them what I wanted to say without really knowing what they really needed. Yeah. It's kind of like a salesman who gets up there and tries to sell you something you don't need. <laughs> right? Everybody hates that guy. Right? So why did you why did you uh, do that? Why did you come tell me all that stuff just so that I could praise you? Or did you tell me all that stuff so I could get something out of it? You know? When you say I love you to somebody, do you expect them to say I love you back? Think about this. We go up to somebody and we say, man, I love you. And then what if they didn't say I love you back? What if they said I don't? What if you said I love you and they did not tell you I love you too? How would that make you feel? Heartbroken. Make you heartbroken, right? Why is that? Yeah, I'll tell you why. Because they didn't say anything back. Right? So I say I love you, and you don't say I love you back. And it hurts me. Do you know why it hurts? Because you really didn't love them. <laughs> if you love someone, you'll love them whether they love you back or not. So if I say I love you and you don't say I love you back, that should be okay. In fact, love still won. Because love does not seek its own way. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. <clears throat> it says love is, uh, verse 4, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. Another translation says it's not self-seeking. It's not irritable or resentful. You know what that means? Irritable means it's easily angered. You know, people will be like, hey, you know what? I have, I have a hard time with patience. No, you don't. You have a hard time with love. Because love is patient. If you're not, if you're not being patient, that means you don't love. Now, the Bible does teach us that love can be perfected, which means I think that you can have a smidgen of love, right? And it maybe need to be perfected. But your love is not mature. Your love is not complete if you can't have patience. You'll be like, don't pray for patience. Yeah, pray for love. If you can pray to love, you'll be a giver. See, that's what love is. Love is giving. Love is not taking. Make sense? Love is not about taking. I didn't get in this relationship so I can get something from you. I got in this relationship so I can give something to you. And that's how our relationships would be. And that's why all of our relationships are failing. Because when we get into the relationship, what we do is we put up this front. We say, I'm going to put the best me on. Because I don't want these people to see really what I'm struggling with. I don't want these people to really see who I am. What if they don't really love me the way I am? So we put up this fake thing. We're the class clown. We joke around all the time. Because people laugh and say things. And, oh, yeah, that, that guy is funny. You know, We want to hang out around. So as long as we're putting up that front, people still like us. We still feel accepted. We still feel important. But what if I stopped telling jokes? Would they still love me? Oh. You know why? Because people don't know how to love. So I put up this entertainment, right? Now they're laughing, and the moment I stop telling jokes, they stop loving me. Why? Because they don't know how to love. Here's the problem we first had. We expect people to love us. Like we deserve it or something. Here's the truth. You know how you get past whether people love you or not? You become the lover. How do you become the lover? You can't go to people. You're going to have to go to God. When you go to God and you realize that God loves you and accepts you just the way that you are with all of your mistakes, with all of your failures, that he loves you right where you're at, that he loved you and didn't expect anything in return, then you start to know what love truly is. And you're like, you know what? That's crazy. If God can love me like that, maybe I can love somebody else like that. So then when you get in the crowd, you don't have to put up a front anymore. You can just love people. And guess what? When they reject you, it doesn't matter. Because you aren't going to them for your value in the first place. You were going to God for your value. So now I've got my value from God, so I can come into a room and everybody can spit on me. 
but I can be very confident in who I am. So we find that pride is really not confident. Confidence is really humility. Whenever we struggle with pride, we're putting up that front, right? We're, we're like, man, look at me, look what I did. You know, I can, you know, we're not, the reason why we have to keep bragging about ourselves is that we don't really believe it. <laughs> we have to keep saying, your faith comes by hearing, right? <laughs> so if I keep talking good about myself, maybe I'll believe it. But I don't believe it. That's why I'm having to put up this front. I'm insecure and I need people to affirm me. Right? But it never satisfies. I continually, even when they come up to me and tell me, yeah, 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 I still beat myself up when I walk away. So, you know, I know they said all that, but it's so backwards, isn't it? Man, I really need people to affirm me. Then somebody comes and affirms you, and you walk away like, no, I don't really believe what they said. They were just being nice. You know why? Because you were not created to get love from people. You were created to get love from the Father. Number one, the reason why God wants you to love people is because the scripture says, how can you love God and not love people? You can't say, oh, I love God and not love people. Why? Because when you love people, what you're really doing is you're showing them the love of God. I'm not actually loving you and giving you something you need. Like, that's what's crazy. When I, I started, I have a ministry called the Barracks. It's a men's discipleship house. We have guys that come drug and alcohol addictions. And these people, they come in. I don't charge them anything. It's free for them. They come in, cuss me out, all kinds of stuff, you know? Walk out on me, abandon me. In the end, they're like, man, I've never been anywhere that somebody truly loved me. Yeah, I know. And that's why we're, they get possessive, too. If I have one guy in the house and it's just me, somebody else will come in and that first guy I was helping will literally sabotage everything that's happened because they don't want to share me. <laughs> and it's very weird, but it's truth because that guy has never been loved before and he doesn't think there's enough to go around. He don't get it. He don't understand that the love from the Father never ends. And so he's still trying to make sense of it. He's thinking that what I'm loving him with is something that came from Zach. But it didn't come from Zach. It came from God. You know? But that's what we're truly all looking for. We're truly looking for true value. And you know why people will never be able to, to, to give you your value? Because they didn't create you. I have a shirt that says, The only one who can define me is the one who designed me. The only one who can define you is the one who designed you. That'd be like an iPhone talking to another iPhone. You're like, hey, iPhone, you think I'm an awesome iPhone? It doesn't matter what the other iPhone thinks. In fact, it doesn't even matter what the own iPhone thinks about itself. Your opinion about you doesn't matter. Everybody's like, oh, we need to sell good. We all need to build our self-esteem. No, you don't. Your self-esteem is pride. <laughs> and it's really insecurity. It doesn't matter how much you think if you feel good about yourself, you're not going to feel good about yourself. Because you really don't need to go think about, your faith in yourself is futile. You're a failure. Get over it. Move on. Realize God's moved on. And he doesn't care how much you fail. He loves you anyway. But we get our value from our failures. We get our value from our accomplishments. Well, I did really good, so now I feel important. No, you don't get it. God loved you and valued you before you had anything to offer. That's the point. I'm a failure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Stop feeling worthless because you're a failure. Because you're a failure doesn't make doesn't your failures don't make you valuable or invaluable. Your accomplishments don't make you valuable or invaluable. It's God's word in your life that makes you valuable. When God says, This is who you are, He sees you for who you really are. He's the one who puts the value on you. I don't know if you guys ever watched familiar with like stock markets or anything like that but really big time investors okay big time investors let's say you have a company that just started out right brand new okay for instance let's talk about apple apple did you know that i don't remember what year it was but let's say back 10 years ago okay did you know that um you can buy what's called stock or shares anybody know what that is stock and shares okay so you're buying a piece of the company Okay, And did you know that that one stock of, of Apple, I don't know, what, 10 years ago? You know what it was worth? Anybody have a guess? Anybody know what it was worth? What do you think, Tori? $7. One stock you could buy for $7 about 10 years ago, roughly. Okay? 
When the iPhone 3 came out, the stock on that on that piece of, of business skyrocketed up to seven hundred dollars. So if you bought ten shares at seven dollars, that would be seventy bucks, right? And then overnight, your stock would go from seventy dollars to seven thousand dollars, right? Make sense? Did I explain that well? <clears throat> now, what made that thing valuable? Obviously, in the world, it is its performance. But let's say that in your mind, you knew what the true potential of that Apple stock was before it skyrocketed. Let's say that to you, you knew its potential. You knew, you just knew that it was going to go up in value because you know what it could be, right? If you knew what it could be, would you have bought the $7 stock? Mm -hmm. Right? Would you have bought it? Before it performed, before the stock performed, there had to be investors that had to believe in it. Okay? That, that the, the investors had to say, I believe that that stock's going to go up. I believe it. I know it. In fact, they're saying it's worth seven, but I believe it's worth 700. So I'm getting in now before everybody else catches on. Because if I can get in now, I'll make a bunch of money. Okay? What's well, the same thing with God? Before you had anything to offer, before you were worth anything, He purchased you with the blood of Jesus. Knowing your potential. That's the thing. God sees your value. Okay, and here's what's cool. Is, here's what's really cool. You know what makes a stock price go up? People buying it. You know why? Because you're only worth what someone's willing to pay for you. So if if I go into America and be like, hey, this is worth a thousand dollars, somebody might be like, it's not worth a thousand dollars for me. I'm going to buy that fifteen dollar flip phone. And somebody else might be like, no, I, it's worth $1,000 to me. So a thing is only worth as much as someone's willing to pay for it. Okay? If I had a big pickup truck out there, would you pay a million dollars for it? No. no. Unless you knew something special about it, right? Unless you knew one day it would be worth a whole lot more. So the, what makes your life worth it is the fact that Jesus, that God, was willing to pay for you the highest price. You went from nothing to the treasure of heaven overnight. Y'all get it? We have to start realizing our true value has nothing to do with our performance. Our true value, our true value has everything to do with what we're willing what someone's willing to pay for us. And God paid the highest price for us. That's why people will never be able to give you your value because they're never going to be able, they're never going to be willing to pay the price to put up with you to to sacrifice for you they're not the lengths that God went to get you back no one is ever going to be able to compare in love and that's why us as believers what we're doing the reason why I can go love somebody unconditionally no matter what they do to me is because of what God's already done for me there's something you know if you want to make friends, okay, you got to make some. You got to you got to put some deposits into people, okay. It's funny because uh, what God's done is He's put a big deposit into us, so that when it's time to withdraw, He can pull it out of us. Does that make sense? If I was to, you know, have you ever have you ever heard that phrase, "Your real friend"? You might not know this, kids, but adults might know this. You know, your true friends are the ones that show up to help you move. You know, find out, who your friends are. find out who your real friends are. Someone who comes up to your house and is willing to climb underneath your house and fix your plumbing. And those are the people who really care. But who's going to do that? Two kinds of people do that. Number one, someone who truly has the love of God in them because they have enough already been given to them. They can give out. Or somebody that you personally poured into. Another reason we do that is because of shame. We're ashamed of who we are. We're ashamed of maybe some things we've done wrong. 
And so what I found is that the only way that you can really um, break that cycle of putting up the front and living a false life, living a fake life, okay, where people don't really know who you are, okay, the, the, the best way to do that is, what I found is that you're either coming to the light or you're hiding, okay? So that's what Adam did. So Adam ran and hid, and he ran from the one who loved him the most, which was God. And he says, Adam, where are you? I ran and hid because I was afraid. So that's what we do. We're afraid. We're afraid to really come to the light. You know why? Because the last time we came out, somebody ridiculed me. Last time I got vulnerable, I got hurt. The last time I let it all hang out, it was just taken advantage of. See what I'm saying? But that's why we have to know who we are in Christ so that we can truly become vulnerable with people. And even if they kill us, we don't take it personally. Because we weren't doing it to get anything back. You see, does it make sense what I'm saying? We're doing it to give. Why? Because the truth is, they need love too. They are wanting to be accepted as well. So if I go out and I give, they're, they're in need as well. But I'm not giving them something so they can learn to get from me. I'm really giving them something. I'm really giving of myself so they can learn Christ, so they can learn who God is. Because I'm, again, trying to get them to have that personal relationship with Jesus. So how do we do that? Okay? Prayer. Prayer is the biggest thing. You know, I always try to get up early in the morning, spend time with Jesus, have my quiet time. I read my Bible, I pray, and I seek God with all my heart. Yeah, he got up too this morning. I got up this morning. Hey, we're all staying up till 2 in the morning, and I woke up at 545. And <laughs> you know? But why? Why, why, you know, why do we do that? You know, the only reason why you would get up that early is if you were preparing to give away. See what I'm saying? So here's what I find People don't, that don't get up early in the morning and spend time with Jesus don't plan on giving anything away. I get that? People who don't get up early in the morning to spend time with Jesus don't plan on giving anything away. You've got to go to the source to get poured into so you can pour out. And however much you want to be able to pour out, you need to be getting poured into Okay. <clears throat> All right. I think I talked about all this stuff. This is just stuff that I prayed and, and felt like the Lord wanted to share. All right. So here's the deal. Everybody truly, hey, uh, brother, can you come up here and we'll go ahead and play some song here. Um, everybody truly wants someone to care about them. Everybody truly wants somebody to care about them. Okay, so know that. First of all, my, the Lord told me this one time. He said, Zach, you are not made for man's applause. I did not create you for man's applause. I created you for my applause, which is so bizarre because we were never taught that really. God wants to give you praise. Did you know that? That's why whenever you die, you stand before him on judgment day. Will he say, well done, good and faithful servant. That's praise. We're looking for God to affirm us. We're really looking for God to speak into us and say, this is who you are. This is who I made you to be. And when we do that, what happens is we start spending time with Jesus. It's called intimacy with God. And when we have intimacy with God, you know what happens whenever a man and woman have intimacy? They have a baby. Okay? So if we're intimate with God, then God starts to birth things inside of us. He starts to give us vision. He starts to give us direction. We start to have meaning. We start to have purpose. So our value didn't come. Look, check this out. Your value didn't come from what you did, but your value actually comes from what he says about you. So when you're in that time with the Lord in the morning and he's speaking to you and he starts to birth things inside of you, you start realizing this is my real potential. This is what my real value is. This is what God really created me to do. This is what God has for me to offer in this world. This is the reason for my existence. No one's going to be able to tell you your purpose except for God. He created you. And check this out. If you find yourself being frustrated, I'm just so frustrated. I feel meaningless. I feel empty. I feel like I can't get anything done. I feel like I'm not really accomplishing anything in my life. I feel like it's all purposeless. Well, the only reason why is because you haven't been seeking the Lord to really find out who you are. Because check this out. If I take a, if I take a coffee mug and I go build a house with it, 
and I start putting a hammer in the wall. I put, put a nail in the wall, and I take that coffee cup and I start to hammer the nail. What happens? It's gonna break. Because I'm taking, I'm using the cup for what it wasn't designed to be used for. So that's what we do. We're like these coffee cups, and we're going out and we're trying to hammer nails in. And we don't, we don't even know our design. We don't even know what God created us to do. We don't even know what we're, our purpose is. And the reason why we don't know our purpose is because we're not going back to the source to find out who we are. If you take this guitar right here, I have a, I have a, I have a little uh, two-year-old. If I take this guitar and I put this guitar in the two-year-old's hand, what's going to happen to it? It's going to break. See, God is the creator. If I take this, if I take this guitar and I go give it to who made that area or artist? Siegel. If I go take this guitar and I take it to Siegel, not only will he be able to play it, but he'll know every purpose behind the guitar. He'll know why it's got a a, a, a spruce top or a mahogany back, or whether it's uh, got a cutaway in it, or whether it's completely open body. Or nobody at all. Maybe it's an electric guitar. Why does it have nylon strings versus metal strings? Does it have a pickup or does it not have a pickup? Is it strictly acoustic? Everything about that guitar, the creator, Siegel, knows its purpose. It knows its design. I made this because I wanted to project a little bit more. No one made it like this because I wanted to have a softer sound. I made it like this so we can blast loud on speakers and do a rock concert. The creator who, who created and fashioned it knows every intricate detail. Did you know that everything you change about that guitar changes the sound? Everything you, you mess with it, it all changes the sound. So you have a sound. God's made you to make sound, as you might say. He created you with every little detail in your life so you can become what he created you to be because you have a specific statement in this life, a specific purpose in this life. And the truth is, we think it's because we want to, we think, oh, I'm here to be loved. Well, if, I'll tell you what, when we get trapped in that mindset of, man, nobody loves me, we already forgot our purpose. Even though it's true, even though we're hurt, even though we're in pain, when we get trapped in there, the truth is, we the devil has completely distracted us from our true purpose, which is not to be loved, but to love. But you can never truly love until you've been loved by your creator. Make sense? So, Mm. Just bow our heads and close our eyes. And <clears throat> Let's just hear the Lord. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness. And just so you all know, there's going to be people up here you just, if you're hurt, if you're in pain, if, if you felt worthless and you're struggling with that and you want to feel value in your life and you want to, you want God to start to show you your purpose in life and, and where he's really leading you while we're having this time of quietness and prayer and reflection, just come on up to the front and let uh, Sean or um, uh, Pastor Darius too uh, if you want to come down and uh, Matt, all three of these guys are going to be up here I'm just going to pray over you guys <clears throat> and if you need someone to talk to and get things off your chest or someone just to pray for you come on up, so Father we thank you Lord we thank you Father you paid the highest price for us Lord we thank you Father that you love us unconditionally there was nothing, Father, that we could do to earn your love. You loved us while we were still your enemies. You cared about us and you put value on us before we had anything to offer. Lord, help us understand that about ourselves and who you say we are, Father. Father, I just pray that your Holy Spirit falls on these young people. Lord, you created us to love. You created us to love people. You created us to bring your love upon this earth. You created us to bring your kingdom upon this earth and set captives free.
Father, you didn't create us to be victims anymore. You created us to be victors, people who could go out and stomp the devil for a living. To set captives free. Second Timothy chapter one. Verse seven says, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self control. For God gave us not a spirit of fear but of power and love and self-control. When Jesus died for us and gave us that new life, he didn't destine us to stay in that shame anymore. He didn't destine us to stay in weakness anymore. He destined us to come to the light, which is painful. It could be a little painful coming to the light, but that was purpose for us to be humbling ourselves to God. The scripture says when we humble ourselves before him, he lifts us up. He exalts us. And he gives us power and self-control. Hmm. So, Father, I pray right now, Lord, that uh, if these students are already dealing with uh, their worth, Father, they know their value in God. The Lord, now they'll be able to see their true potential in you. And, Lord, they'll be able to go from this place and they'll be able to go out and set the world free. That they'll be able to advance the kingdom of God in power, Father. Lord, they won't just be in power and touching other people's lives, but Father, they'll be able to conquer their own demons in their own lives where maybe they're struggling with sin or struggling with um, like a habitual sin or anything like that. Lord, they'll be able to be a victorious person over that. Lord, I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, they won't be um, bound up anymore. They won't live the lie or believe the lie that they can't win. But Father, you say in your word, Father, that sin will have no dominion over you. We set our mind on the things of the Spirit. We'll not gratify the desires of the flesh. But Father, you created us to be victors, more than conquerors through Christ. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Thank you guys for watching. I hope this teaching blessed you and, and inspired you and helped you out a little bit. Man, if, the, if it was a blessing for you, please uh, share the video, like it, leave a comment if you have questions. I'll, be, I'll try to answer these questions and whatnot. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Go to our Facebook page and make sure you've already liked the page. Hover your mouse over following and make sure see first is checked. If there's a check mark there, then you know that you'll be seeing our videos in your newsfeed. Also, if you're wanting to support our ministry and help fund missions work and help uh, support drug and alcohol recovery, please go to our website, boldestalignedministries.com or www.balmzs.com and you'll see here there's a donate button. You just hit this donate button right there. It'll give you an opportunity to, to sow into the ministry. Right there, you can see Boulders Line Ministries. You can give 30 bucks a month, $50 a month, or $100 a month, or just a one-time gift if you want. Also, you can go to our website, 3rcandles.com. Remember, all the candles are handmade by our students in recovery, and so you can select from our wide range of products. I mean, we just have tons of candles, you can see right there. And also, be sure to sign up for the VIP offers. We can get 25% off your next purchase. You'll be able to receive offers we have. We're also gonna be doing some free test strips for fragrance as well so make sure that you sign up right here and, and all that good stuff so have a good day